The Lord be with you. Pastor Moak here, Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church. Today we have class number 22, which we are going to talk about confession and absolution. And that is why I have my violet clergy shirt on that I normally only wear during the season of Lent, which is a penitential season, a season of confession, a season of repentance, uh, in which we acknowledge all of our sins and thought, word, and deed that we have committed and omitted against our Lord and our neighbor. But of course, uh, the climax of that season uh, happens on Good Friday when Jesus died for all those sins. But either way, uh, Violet Clergy shirt, um, think of the season of Lent confession. Let's uh, dive right into it. Let's turn to page 32 um, in our catechisms. As the head of the household should teach his uh, family to pray uh, morning and evening. In the morning when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let's confess the creed together. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Luther's morning prayer, I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, now before we turn uh, to our catechism, which, by the way, if you wanted to get to the page, we are going to be on page 217. It's 217, if you want to mark that. What we're going to do now is we're going to sing a hymn. Uh, that teaches us about this uh, doctrine of confession. <clears throat> and so if you want to turn to hymn 608 in your hymnal, in your Lutheran service book, hymnal 608, and this is uh, uh, the confession and absolution section of the hymnal, which precedes, immediately precedes, uh, the Lord's Supper section. So we're going to sing all four verses. Ready? Lord, to you I make confession. I have sinned and gone astray. I have multiplied transgression, chosen for myself my way, led by you to see my errors. Lord, I tremble at your terrors. Yet though conscience voice upon me, Father, I will seek your face. Though your child I dare not call me, yet receive me in your grace. Do not for my sins forsake me. Let your wrath not overtake me. For your Son has suffered for me, given himself to rescue me died to save me and restore me, reconciled and set me free. Jesus' cross alone can vanquish these dark fears and soothe this anguish. Lord, on you I cast my burden, sink it in the deepest sea. Let me know your gracious pardon, 
cleanse me from iniquity. Let your Spirit leave me never. Make me only yours forever. All right. Don't close that. We may come back and reference it if I remember to do so. Let's turn now to the confession section in our catechism on page 217. Notice how this section starts. It starts with a quote from Appendix B, Brief Exhortation, paragraph 32. When This is Luther's writing. When I urge you to, do, to go to confession, I am doing nothing else than urging you to be a Christian. Now, a few words on this exhortation to confession. This is in our Book of Concord, and it is an appendix. The reason it's an appendix, and by the way, as an appendix, it's at the very end. So the Book of Concord has several different parts. It first has the Augsburg Confession, then the Apology. Oh my goodness, I'm getting my order mixed up. I believe it's in the Small Cloud Articles, uh, then the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope, Small Catechism, Large Catechism. I may be having the order mixed up here. Uh, then we have the Formula of Concord, and there's two parts of that, the Epitome and the Solid Declaration. The Brief Exhortation to Confession first appeared in the 1529 revised edition of the Large Catechism. I'm reading here on page 649. I know the pages are going to be, the pagination is different depending on uh, which uh, reader's edition of the Book of Concord you have. If you have a reader's edition, you might have the Triglata. Uh, you also, also might have the Colvin Wangers. There are different versions of this. But either way, this is a little interesting note. However, it did not, this exhortation to confession, did not appear in the original 1580 German or 1584 Latin editions of the Book of Concord. Therefore, it was not included in the Concordia Triglata, which is uh, probably our most used uh, version in the Missouri Synod. Okay, so this, this study uh, guide uh, doesn't come out until uh, the 21st century. The Triglata was used for pretty much all the 20th century, uh, and I actually I don't know beyond that. I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. Anyways, this exhortation, while it's not in the original Book of Concord, uh, it is a wonderful explanation of what confession and absolution is and, it's, and the role of confession in the Christian life. I want to read this first sentence here. We have always urged that confession should be voluntary and that the Pope's tyranny should cease. Okay, so because in the Bible there is not an explicit command, like we have in the sense of baptism and in the Lord's Supper. We have explicit commands from Christ to do this. When it comes to private confession, there is not an explicit command of Jesus. So it should be voluntary, not church order, because it's not biblically mandated. Okay, now I want to go to skip ahead to paragraph 5 here. And I know we're going to get to the small catechism. I should have told you to grab your book of Concord if you want to follow along, because this is just important stuff. It helps get the context for what we're going to learn today. Okay, now, paragraph 5. Everyone is now aware of this, but unfortunately, people have learned it only too well. Well, what have they learned? Besides, we have the advantage of knowing that to make a beneficial use of confession for the comfort and strengthening of our consciences. So because the Pope had not, uh, because Lutherans did not force this upon them anymore, people said, well, if I don't have to do it, I'm not going to do it. Well, it's kind of like the Lord's Supper. Well, you're not forced to do it, and you might say, well, I don't need it. Well, that'd be a wrong way of thinking. This is what Luther's going to explain. They do as they please and apply their freedom wrongfully as if it meant that they ought not or must not go to confession. For we readily understand whatever is our advantage, and we find it especially easy to take in whatever is mild and gentle in the gospel. But as I have said, this is going to be strong words from Luther here, such pigs should not be allowed near the gospel nor have any part of it. They should stay under the Pope and let themselves continue to be driven and pestered to confess, to fast, and so on. For whoever does not want to believe the gospel, live according to it, and do what a Christian ought to be doing, should not enjoy any of its benefits either. Well, those are strong words, aren't they? So in other words, we can't do the gospel. Yes, it's alone. Uh, the gospel alone saves us. But there are other aspects to the word of God. We should live according to it. Okay, I'm going to read that sentence one more time. For whoever does not want to believe the gospel, live according to it, and do what a Christian ought to be doing, should not enjoy any of its benefits either. Imagine they're wanting to enjoy only the benefits without accepting any of the responsibilities or investing anything of themselves. What sort of thing is that? We do not want to make preaching available for that sort, nor to grant permission that our freedom and its enjoyment be opened up to them. Instead, we will let the Pope and the likes of him take over and force them to his will, genuine tyrant that he is. The rabble that will not obey the gospel deserves nothing else than the kind of jailer who is God's devil and hangman. 
But to others who gladly hear the gospel, we must keep on preaching, admonishing, encouraging, and coaxing them not to forget the precious and comforting treasure offered in the gospel. <clears throat> Therefore, we here intend to say also a few words about confession in order to instruct and admonish the uninformed. So my guess is 95% of those in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod today have no idea what the role of confession is in the Christian life. Because in the 20th century, and I don't know, this could be even predate this, we had this huge emphasis on being anti-Roman Catholic. So instead of looking at what is the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, and certainly there were errors when it comes to confession, no, no doubt about it. There's no, no question there. But what has happened was, is because private confession was a Roman Catholic thing, therefore people said, well, it can't be a Lutheran thing. So they viewed too much of the external things and said, what is the heart of the issue? And that's what we're getting at today. So you might be one of the uninformed. So I'm here to try to help inform you of this role of confession in the Christian life. Now, we're going to get to that, but I want to first make sure we get through the small catechism. And this kind of helps split, the, split, the, uh, split everything up. So, reminder here, page 217, we're going to do the small catechism now. We'll come back to the, uh, the Book of Concord, this exhortation to confession. So, once again, when I urge you to go to confession, I'm doing nothing else than urging you to be a Christian. All right, let's jump right into it. So, what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness, from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. So what sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. So which are these? Important question. So what are the sins that we should feel in our hearts? Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father? Mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? So again, looking at the Ten Commandments in our seat in life. So for example, if you're not a pastor, you shouldn't ask yourself, well, have I preached the word of God faithfully? Because that wouldn't apply to you. But it does apply to me. So everyone has their own vocations. So we should ask ourselves, in light of the Ten Commandments, how have we kept them? Or, more importantly, where have we erred? Where have we disobeyed in thought, word, or deed? So that would be a grounds for uh, coming to confession, where we have uh, those, those areas that, that are perhaps troubling our conscience. Maybe there's a certain area that we are just really struggling with. And if you're, and everyone struggles with something. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go to the pastor every week and confess your sins uh, just because it's, it's uh, as a formality. Private confession is intended for those who are really, really harboring uh, 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 despair or, or feelings on their heart because of continual sin. And someone might say, well, I don't have anything like that. Well, first, check yourself. There is always something that plagues your conscience. Uh, in, in some way, some sin, thought, word, or deed. It happens to all of us. We have our pet sins, as they like to say. Those sins that tend to get us every single time, over and over again. Those plague our conscience. Now, sometimes the sinful flesh might ignore it and might get, get over it, so to speak. Uh, but if we're continually doing them, that is something worth bringing out of the darkness into the marvelous light that the word of Christ may absolve it and it is through absolution alone that we have the power and the ability it's through the gospel alone that we have the power and ability to amend our lives and do better okay so let's keep going here oh, but before we go uh, I'm gonna go back to something so at the top of page 217 I want you to write something here so last I think it was last class we learned about the two parts of repentance and we said it was contrition and faith look at the two parts of confession here confess our sins and receive absolution and remember when we talked about repentance, we're contrition, we're contrite in heart, we have sorrow of our sins, and we have faith which trusts in the forgiveness of sins. So it's absolutely necessary that you have repentance and faith. Faith that trusts the consoling promise of the gospel. And it's basically the same thing here. That in confession there's two parts. Confess our sins, so acknowledge them. That's the contrition side of repentance. And then receive absolution. So in the two, second half of uh, repentance was contrition and faith. And here the second part of confession is confess our sins. And the second half would be receive absolution. And we receive it by faith, by trusting it. So what I want you to write at the top of page 217, and I know I said that really fast, but this is going to help uh, digest it here. I want you to write these words. We confess our sins 
and receive absolution, when in distress over sins, we believe absolution. So it basically gets the confession and reception and contrition and faith part all rhyming, essentially. So, again, right here. Uh, we confess our sins and receive absolution when in distress over sins we believe absolution. So again, to receive forgiveness, it's by faith alone. Faith grasps and holds on to the promise. All right, let's go to uh, question 261. What is the first part of confession? The first part of confession is that we confess or we acknowledge our sins. Now the two Psalms that are listed here as Bible verses, 874 and 875, are known as penitential Psalms. We're going to talk more about those when we get to the private confession right from our hymnal, which we are going to do together. But both of those uh, Psalms and all the penitential Psalms, what the psalmist does is he confesses, he acknowledges his sin before God. So it would be a shameful thing not to acknowledge our sin because then we are holding on to it. There is no shame in confession. There is no shame in acknowledging our sin before God. Okay, uh, question uh, 262. What sins should we confess before God? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. And I want you to put a star next to Bible verse 876 on the top of page 219. And this is, he this is the verse that teaches us about confessing our sins before God, even the ones that we don't know about, that we are unaware of. Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. So we all have hidden faults. We all have, first of all, we all have blind spots. There's things that we do that we think or we say that we don't even realize is sin. And those are the things that we do. How about the sins of omission? The things that we should do that we failed to do. Sometimes in our own, we get so caught up in our own world and our self-centeredness that we realize that we forgot to neglect our neighbor who was in need. In fact, this happened to me just a few days ago. I had a neighbor uh, whose sump pump uh, uh, went and uh, they started having their basement flooded. And uh, he told me he was on his way to Home Depot. He asked me if he had a box fan. I said, yeah, sure. In the meantime, while he's running to the store, instead of me saying, hey, man, what can I do to help in the meantime? I'm just thinking, oh, man, that stinks for him. Uh, man, I'm, oh, man, what do I got to do to get my house in order to make sure my sump pump doesn't go? Like, again, self-centeredness, self-inward thinking. Instead of saying, hey, man, how can I lend a hand? You need me to pump water for the next 25 minutes as you run to the store to get a new sump pump? You get the point. So, again, this is what we confess before God. Even our innocent faults that we don't even realize we're doing or omitting to do. Declare me innocent, O Lord. All right, let's go to question 263. What sin should we confess before our neighbor? Before our neighbor, we should confess all sins we have committed against him or her. 879. Put a star next to this Bible verse. This is where we get this uh, biblical mandate to confess our sins to one another. Again, be clear, there isn't a biblical mandate to go to your pastor to confess the sins. But there is a, uh, a command to confess our sins to our neighbor. And so next time I see my neighbor, I should tell him, Hey man, I'm sorry, I'm an idiot. I should have offered you help. Again, that's our duty. As Christians, we should live that way. Okay, James 5, 16, I'll put a star next to it. Confess your sins to one another. Let's go to the next one, 264. What sins are we encouraged to confess privately before our pastor or confessor? Now, this is important because maybe you're unsure of uh, your pastor. You know, and I get that. Human nature, uh, man, well, pastor's got to deal with me all the time. I mean, I'm scared for him to know uh, of, of what my sins are, what they, what they are, what they might not be, whatever. Um, but it's still important that you go, if, if you're something that's, uh, well, let's read the answer first. Before the pastor or confessor, we confess those sins which we know and feel in our hearts, especially those that trouble us. So whether you go to your pastor or a confessor, that would be another pastor who will absolve you of your sins. Um, those that we go to, the, the, those who, uh, th those sins that are troubling us, that's what we would confess to a pastor or a confessor. So if you went to a pastor who wasn't your pastor, he would be your confessor. So I have a confessor because I don't have a pastor. There's no one who is called to be my pastor. So therefore, I, uh, when I go to confession, it's to a confessor. Does that make sense? So if you, if you were a member of my church and you came to me, you would be going to your pastor. If you were watching this and you were not a member of my church and you came to me for a confession, you would be going to your confessor. Does that make sense? But it's the same office here in terms of the uh, absolution, the forgiveness of sins being bestowed upon you for Jesus' sake. All right, let's keep going. Um, uh, I would just m remind you here, this note here at the bottom of page 219. Note, no one may be forced to make private confessions. No one ever forces it. Okay, so uh, flip the page. Page uh, Question 265. What is the second part of confession? 
The second part of confession is that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness of sins. Pretty straightforward, 266. How should we regard the absolution, that is, forgiveness, spoken by the pastor? We should receive the pastor's absolution as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Look at this quote here from the Augsburg Confession, Article 25. Our people are taught that they should highly prize the absolution as being God's voice and pronounced by God's command. So while going to private confession is not God's command, the pronouncement of forgiveness, God does command us to speak the word of forgiveness when those who are penitent confess their sins. That's going to be, by the way, next class as we learn about the office of the keys. In the meantime, I want you to circle two Bible verses here, 885 and 886. Uh, Luke 10, verse 16, the one who hears you, hears me. This is Jesus speaking to those whom he is sending out uh, to preach the word on his behalf. The one who hears you, hears me. So the pastor, this is why in, in confession uh, and absolution in the divine service, the pastor says, In the stead and by the command of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Man, when I first became a pastor, I miserably struggled with those words because I thought I... I it was uh, it was almost an embarrassment for me to get up there as a sinful man uh, who has you know, who is not holy at all because no human being is um, apart from Christ um, and and to speak those words that I forgive you but you know and even though I knew it wasn't my words it was Christ's words it was still hard for me it was humbling it was humiliating to speak those words on his behalf but then I have since grown to love God's word and know that it is it, uh, it have more faith in Jesus words that it's Christ's words of forgiveness not my own. So you see, my point here is, is I've increased in my own faith in Christ's word on this command to forgive sins. Um, and so pray, praise God for that. We should uh, embrace that forgiveness of sins that Christ has given to his church uh, to be pronounced to you. Okay, getting ahead of myself, I don't want to. Um, but by the way, where is this given? Where is this mandate of forgiving, sin, forgiving sins given? It's the next Bible verse I had you circle, 886. John 20, verse 23. This is Jesus speaking, by the way, on the day he uh, rose from the dead, as he institutes the office of the ministry, again, we're going to learn that next class, but a little bit of uh, foreshadowing here. John 20, verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And again, trusting Jesus' words. So I've been given authority as a pastor to forgive sins. So when I give them, it's not my forgiveness, it's not my words, it's Christ's words. We'll talk about more of this in the private confession. 267, though. What assurance do I have that my private confession to the pastor will remain confidential? The pastor is pledged not to tell anyone of sins told him in private confession, for those sins have been removed. Now, uh, this is a vow that a pastor makes in his ordination installation that he will not divulge that any sins that are confessed uh, to him. If your pastor were to do that, that is instant grounds for removal of office. That's how serious it is, and every pastor knows how serious it is. That he cannot say a word. He doesn't go home and tell his wife. He doesn't tell his secretary. He doesn't tell the elders. Nobody. No one will ever hear sins that are absolved. And again, if it were to happen, uh, that is grounds for removal of office. Okay, put a star next to Bible verse 887. Uh, this is a reminder to us of the fact that the sins have been removed. It's my favorite psalm. Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And you know, as far as east is from the west, that's infinite, infinite distance apart. All right, 268. What is the benefit of private confession and absolution? In private confession and absolution, God himself, through the pastor, forgives each individual the sins that are confessed. Quote here from this uh, brief exhortation, Appendix B in the Book of Concord. I'm pointing to it because it's like sitting before me right here. Uh, the quote here, So any heart that feels its sinfulness and desires consolation has here a sure refuge when he hears God's word and makes the discovery that God through a human being looses and absolves him from his sins. Okay, uh, one last word on absolve before we get back to our, because uh, we're done now with our lesson for today. So I know there's this short form of confession here. We're going to actually do the private confession right from the hymnal, uh, which is it, which is the, the modern one. So this is the one in the catechism is an example. We're going to give you the one that's actually in our hymnal. Um, but a word, quick word on the word uh, absolution. I don't know if I've done this before, but think of the word dissolve. If you have a cup of water and you put salt in it, the salt would dissolve. That means that you can't see anymore, but guess what? The salt's still there. If you, if you, if you measure the water for saline uh, content, um, it would still be there, right? Now, the word absolution 
is uh, so imagine in this in this in this uh, in illustration here that the salt going into the water the salts are sins so the salts staining the water so to speak our sins are still in us uh, if sins were just dissolved they would still be there uh, and we would be held accountable to them but here's what absolution means in Latin ab is a prefix that means away from or from so absolution means you pour this pour the uh, the salt that is our sin into a cup absolution is the salt is removed. That's what forgiveness is. It's the removal of our sins from us. And what a precious gift it is. That's what the Christian comes to church for, to receive absolution, to receive that forgiveness of sins by faith uh, over and over again. Because every time we receive it, every time we receive absolution, it strengthens, uh, and, we, and, we, and we believe it, it strengthens our faith because it's a means of grace. And so this is why we come to church. And this is why we have numerous instances of forgivenesses throughout the forgiveness throughout the divine service. We got the absolution, we got it in the gospel, we got it in the sermon, we got it in the Lord's Supper. All these instances of forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. Too many times people think, what do we need so much forgiveness for? Well, it's not mathematical in the sense of one plus one plus one uh, equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals one. And it increases our faith. It increases uh, our trust in God's word. The more forgiveness we get, the more we receive it by faith. So see, it's a, it's a cyclical thing. The more forgiveness of sins that's poured on, and the more I believe it, the more I will believe it. So you see what I'm saying? It's an increase of faith. It's a means of grace. So keep on clinging to it, and it'll increase your faith in all avenues of trusting God and his word. Keep receiving absolution. All right. Um, what was I going to do here? Oh, uh, before we go to the brief exhortation, let's go to private confession. Now, in the hymnal, let's turn to page 292. I'm trying to make sure I keep this video under an hour because I know there's a lot of stuff I'm doing outside of what the syllabus says. But this is all about confession, so we might as well uh, explain it all here in one place. Okay, um, look at the rubric. Remember, rubric are the red words. It's giving us directions of what to do. You may prepare yourself, I'm on page 292, by meditating on the Ten Commandments. By the way, if you want to find them in your hymnal, it's on page 321 and 322. If you're a Christian, you should know them. And I, and I take this very seriously. You should know God's Word. You should know the Ten Commandments by heart and the meanings, what they mean in your, in, for your life. Because when you know something, it's on your mind, uh, it's on your heart, it'll be on your lips. Okay, now, aside from the Ten Commandments, you can also pray the penitential psalms. We talked about this in our catechism when we had those two cited. There are seven of them. These are designations uh, uh, that someone made about the psalms, and it's because if you read them, the, 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 genual, uh, the genuine tone of it is penitential in nature, hence we call them the penitential psalms. And so all seven of those psalms that are listed there for you, 632, 38, 51, 102, 130, 143, all help you get in the right mindset of what being uh, a contrite sinner means. All right, now, if you are not burdened with particular sins, don't trouble yourself or search for or invent other sins, thereby turning confession into a torture. Instead, mention one or two sins that you know and let that be enough. Now, this is the incredible comforting part. This whole private confession thing, I have all my confirmation students, we always do this. We do this right together, by the way. And I always tell them, all right, guys, this isn't scary. Everyone thinks it's scary. We're all going to sit together. We're, you guys are going to read the part that's in bold. I'm going to read the part for the pastor. And then when it's all over, I say, oh, that wasn't so bad, was it? And then the week after, I'll always say, hey, uh, did anyone have any nightmares about uh, confession last week? And they all laugh at me because they know it's silly because it is silly. Nothing to be afraid of. Being afraid to confess sins is a lie of Satan. Because what he wants is he wants you to be so afraid of your sins to confess them that you keep them inside, that you internalize them, and then you try to figure it out on your own. And what that can, tends to lead to is one of two things. You either become a Pharisee, well, you know, the sins that bother me or that consume me aren't as bad as my neighbor, or they lead us to despair. Oh, my sins are so great, I'm never going to be able to receive forgiveness. That's what Satan wants, one of those two things, because both of those things lead to hell. Because if we're a Pharisee and we think that our sins aren't that bad, we're not going to confess them. And then our sins are going to be held accountable to us. But if we lead the road of despair, then we're not going to trust in Jesus for forgiveness. And remember, what's the grounds for salvation? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So believe in Christ's word. Confession's good. Repentance is good. It's a good thing. It's a God-pleasing thing. Nothing to be ashamed of. And by, oh, well, I'm going to get to this in the exhortation, uh, so I won't get ahead of myself. Let's do this now. All right, so um, I also tell people uh, just to get in the habit of confession, maybe the first time you come, you don't say anything that's private in nature. You just simply go through the right. Get the feel of it. See what it's like. Because even the confession that's written here um, is, is still a confession. And you still and if you trust those words and you actually are contrary in heart for the sins that are written down here, and you receive absolution, praise God, you've just gotten the means of grace. And he, 
increase of faith. All right, so you would say, and by the way, if this were in, in real real time, and this is great because I got the cross here. I was going to do this video outside because it's a nice day, but I wanted to have the cross. So if this was a real setting, if you were the confessor, you'd be sitting here, and I'd be in my office like this. And I do it on purpose this way. That way, it's, it, it visually tells you as you're confessing your sins, it's going through one ear and out the other right to Christ. He hears your confession. I'm just his mouthpiece. Okay? So that way, I'm not looking at you. There is no visual symbolism of judgment on any part whatsoever. I'm simply here to be the ears and the mouth of the Lord. Okay, so you would say, Pastor, please hear my confession and pronounce forgiveness in order to fulfill God's word. I would say, proceed. And usually I would say your name. And you would say, and notice, by the way, how this confession here is going to basically be a reflection of the Ten Commandments. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. That's the first commandment. <clears throat> as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. First commandment is if I'm the idol. Now it's going to get to the second commandment. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. So prayers, second commandment. You misusing God's name. I have not, That's the second commandment. My worship, there's your third commandment. Remember the Sabbath table, keeping it holy. We've just confessed here in these first two sentences our breaking of the first table of the law between us and God. Now, the, second, the next part here is us, between us and our neighbor. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. Love my neighbor as myself. Fail to do it. And I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt, sins of commission, and those whom I have failed to help, sins of omission. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. Now here's the rubric. If you wish to confess specific sins that trouble you, continue as follows. And here's where you would say, what troubles me particularly is that, whatever it is that's on your heart. And again, don't try to go through all this list. Don't, whatever, whatever you do, don't try to impress the pastor with anything like that. That might, you know, some vanity thing might cross your mind. No, confess what's on your heart and that's it. Don't mumble with words. Don't, don't try to make this long list. If it's one or two things, fine. Don't think that because this, this right, you can see how fast it is. It's, you know, less than five minutes, basically. Don't think you got to turn it into a worship service. It's got to be an hour long. Say what's on your heart. And, I will, and, and if you're ever stumbling or struggling, I would say, um, is there anything that you are specifically struggling with? Like, I, that's the only time I ever kind of in, input my voice here. All right. Now, at the end of this, um, you would conclude by saying, I'm sorry for all this and ask for grace. I want to do better. So even if you didn't divulge any of your private sins and you just went from the last line here, my thoughts uh, and desires have been soiled with sin, you could just skip down to, I'm sorry for all this and ask for grace. I want to do better. Then I would respond. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. And then you say amen. Remember what amen means? Yes, yes, it shall be so. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. What a blessing. In, right after confession, uh, right after confessing our sins and we feel like this, this, all this weight, because you know that's the thing, is uh, when we tend to internalize sin, it kind of, it's internal. When we confess it, we feel, actually feel a weight. Because there, now it's not just internal, it's there. It's, been, it's, 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 it's the elephant in the room. Okay, and now this is the beautiful thing. So the pastor is going to say, do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Faith alone can say, yes. And the pastor says, let it be done for you as you believe. And then he puts his hand on your head. And, he, and I always do, I press this firm on purpose. Because that all that weight that you're feeling, that elephant in the room that's sitting on you, so to speak, whatever it is that's troubling you, that there it is, kind of symbolizing my hands on your head. I'm going to make sure you can see. Holding tight, you can see the tension in my fingers. And then I say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I lift the hands off and make the sign of the cross. And it is that it, the, the weight that's coming off your head is symbolic of the actual event of your sins being removed. Praise be to God. What a wonderful gift that is. And then it says the pastor may speak additional scripture passages to comfort and strengthen the faith of those who have great burdens of conscience or are sorrowful and distressed. And I would say the default, and if a pastor's watching this, which, who, who knows? Who knows? Watch it. I would say, leave your words out. Don't add to God's word. They've just received absolution. The only time I would say anything at all is if I notice that in that pronouncement, the person still was visibly torn up over things, as if maybe um, they were struggling to actually believe what had just happened. And the only time I would say anything is just to remind them of the absolution they just received. Keep speaking the word of forgiveness. 
they can't you can never hear it enough right so that's the only time I would add any words and I would caution people from adding anything else let God's Word do its thing and with that said at the end here so I before the pastor says go in peace amen there are some times where I will say a, or I will read a psalm and that's again that's the only time if I know that the someone is really torn up I might read some of the words of like Psalm 103 that we said before that's one of the options here actually as far as the east is from the west so far the Lord has removed your transgressions from you. And to remind them, this is scripture, man. Your iniquity has been removed. Forgiveness is, uh, your sins are gone. They've been forgiven. They've been absolved, removed completely. That's the only time. And then, after that, maybe perhaps reading a psalm, then depart in peace. Amen. Okay, so faith alone can trust in this wonderful gift of forgiveness. And that's, by the way, uh, Lutherans emphasize here. Is we don't emphasize the private confession part. We emphasize we emphasize the private absolution part, the forgiveness of sins. All right, so there's your private confession and absolution. And now let's go back to our Book of Concord, our brief exhortation to confession. And now I'm going to read uh, the rest of this word for word uh, so you can, get a, you can get the sense of what's going on here. So paragraph 8. In the first place, here's where Luther is going to make his case for confession. Uh, so again, this is Appendix B in your Book of Concord, which is at the end of the Book of Concord, paragraph 8. By the way, the 8 is the, the number on the side. It's pretty obvious, but you're wondering, it's, they, they call them paragraphs. So in the first place, I have said that besides the confession here being considered, there are two other kinds, which may even more properly be called the Christian's common confession. They are A, the confession and plea for forgiveness made to God alone, and B, the confession that is made to the neighbor alone. We talked about this in the small catechism. Those are the two biblically mandated confessions. Confess to God, confess to your neighbor. These two kinds of confession are included in the Lord's Prayer in which we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and so on. In fact, the entire Lord's Prayer is nothing else than such a confession. For what are our petitions other than a confession that we neither have nor do what we ought, as well as a plea for grace and a cheerful conscience? Confession of this sort should and must continue without let up as long as we live. For the Christian way essentially consists in acknowledging ourselves to be sinners and in praying for grace. You've heard me teach this over and over again. The Christian life is one of daily repentance. That's what it is, right? So we continue to confess our sins. Similarly, paragraph 10, the other of the two confessions, the one that every Christian makes to his neighbor, is also included in the Lord's Prayer. For here we mutually confess our guilt and our desire for forgiveness to one another, James 5.16. That's uh, I had you start that verse in your small catechism, by the way. Um, before coming before God and begging for his forgiveness, Matthew 5. Now all of us are guilty of sinning against one another. Therefore, we may and should publicly confess this before everyone without shrinking in one another's presence. For what the proverb says is true. If anyone is, per if anyone is perfect, then all are. There is no one at all who fulfills his obligations toward God and his neighbor. That's kind of the point. So if one person is perfect, everyone is. In other words, everyone's imperfect. Everyone sins. Besides such universal guilt, there is also the particular guilt of the person who has provoked another to rightful anger and needs to ask his pardon. So we have in the Lord's Prayer a double absolution. There we are forgiven both our offenses before God and those against our neighbor, and there we forgive our neighbor and become reconciled to him. Besides this public, daily, and necessary confession, there is also the confidential confession that is only made before a single brother. If something particular weighs upon us or troubles us, something with which we keep torturing ourselves and can find no rest, and we do not find our faith to be strong enough to cope with it, then this private form of confession gives us the opportunity of laying the matter before some brother. We may receive counsel, comfort, and strength when and however often we wish. That we should do this is not included in any divine command, as are the other two kinds of confession. So this is the point here about private confession for your pastor is not mandated by God. Rather, it is offered to everyone who may need it as an opportunity to be used by him as his need requires. And this is why every week at Zion on Wednesdays from seven, from 6.15 till 7 o'clock, it's offered. Anyone who wants to come, I'm there in my office. I'm ready for you. And, I, I, and if you're watching this and, and I'm not your pastor, I would encourage your pastor, have private confession absolution hours. Just make it available. Uh, because any, any every pastor will say, well, yeah, if you ever want to make you know private confession, I'm, I'm available. 
And, and, and your people know that, but your people also know you're busy and they don't want to take your time. And the thing about sins is we want to find any excuse to keep them inside. So help get rid of that excuse. Just make yourself available. That way they know, you know, pastor's here. He's not, he's not uh, um, opening up his schedule even more, making himself busier. He's there. You know it's there. It's available for you. Okay. Uh, rather, it is offered to everyone who may need it as an opportunity to be used by him as his need requires. I'm in paragraph 14, by the way. The origin and establish of private confession lies in the fact that Christ himself placed his absolution into the hands of his Christian people with the command that they should absolve one another of their sins, Ephesians 4.32. So any heart that feels its sinfulness and desires consolation has here a sure refuge when he hears God's word and makes the discovery that God through a human being looses and absolves him from his sins. So notice then, that confession, as I have often said, consists of two parts. The first is my own work and action when I lament my sins and desire comfort and refreshment of my soul. Remember the two parts of confession of the small catechism? First, I confess my sins. Contrition. So, what was it again? When, uh, I, I, when we confess our sins, we receive absolution. When in distress of our sins, we believe absolution. <clears throat> The other part is a work that God does when he declares me free of my sin through his word placed in the mouth of a man. And that's the beautiful thing about private confession. Is it, it's again, it's as if Jesus spoke those words himself. So God's words are put into the mouth of a man in the pronouncement of absolution. <clears throat> it is this splendid, noble thing that makes confession so lovely, so comforting. It used to be that we emphasized it only as our work. All that we were then concerned about was whether our act of confession was pure and perfect in every detail. We paid no attention to the second and most necessary part of confession, nor did we proclaim it. So in other words, under the papacy, the emphasis was all upon our confession, what we do, not upon what God does in absolving the sins. We acted just as if confession were nothing but a good work by which, by which payment was to be made to God so that if the confession was inadequate and not exactly correct in every detail, then the absolution would not be valid and the sin unforgiven. By this, the people were driven to the point where everyone had to despair of making so pure a confession an obvious impossibility and where no one could feel at ease in his conscience or have confidence in his absolution. So they not only rendered the precious confession useless to us, but also made it a bitter burden, causing noticeable spiritual harm and ruin. In our view of confession, therefore, we should sharply separate its two parts far from each other. We should place slight value on our part in it, but we should hold in high and great esteem God's word in the absolution part of confession. We should not proceed as if we intended to perform and offer him a splendid work, but simply to accept and receive something from him. You dare not coming, saying how good or bad you are. And I underline this part, and I would too if I were you. I'm going to read that again. You dare not come, saying how good or bad you are. If you are a Christian, I in any case know well enough that you are. If you are not, I know that even better. So in other words, don't ever think for a second that I'm going to come and, and, and uh, I have to try to prove how good or bad I am. If you're a Christian, we know what that means. It means you're a poor, miserable sinner. But if you're a Christian, that also means that you trust in Jesus for forgiveness. And therefore you are absolved. And that's why you're coming to receive that absolution. So don't ever think for a second your pastor is going to think less of you. Honestly, I tell this to people all the time. I think more of you when you come. Why? Because it shows your contrition. It shows your faith. Because it shows... I, I, I acknowledge, I know what my sins are, and I need that forgiveness of sins. So, in other words, so make that clear again. I think more of you when you come, no matter what it is that you confess. Don't ever think for a second that, oh, I respected you before. Oh, now I know your sins, and now I respect you less. Not at all. Again, the fact that you know your sins, and you're not ashamed to confess them, I respect that more than anything in the world, because I know how terrifying it is because I've been on the other side of the confession of booth before. I know what it's like. Okay. But what you must see, too, is that you lament your problem and then you let yourself be helped to acquire a cheerful heart and conscience. Paragraph 20. Moreover, no one may now pressure you with commandments. Rather, what we say, too, is this. Whoever is, 
what we say is this. Man, I'm doing a terrible job of reading. You're probably like, stop watching this video by now because I just can't read today. Uh, whoever is a Christian or would like to be one is here faithfully is advised to go and get the precious treasure. That's kind of, uh, that is the quote that began our lesson today in the small catechism. Whoever is a Christian or would like to be one is here faithfully advised to go and get the precious treasure. If you are no Christian and do not desire such comfort, we shall leave it to another to use force on you. In other words, well, if you don't think you need it, then sure, go, go be Pope, go be Papist, go be Roman Catholic. By eliminating all need for the Pope's tyranny, command, and coercion, we cancel them with a single sweep. As I have said, we teach that whoever does not go to confession willingly and for the sake of obtaining the absolution, he may as well forget about it. Yes. And whoever goes around relying on the purity of his act of making confession, let him stay away. So in other words, if you were trying to look, like, oh, look how pious I am. Oh, look, I went to confession. Stay away from it. That ain't for you. It's for the troubled heart, the one that's lamenting uh, in his conscience. That's the person needs, that ought to run to receive it. But if you're doing it to be pious or you're doing it to show off, stay away. Because that's just, it's, it's just condemning you even more. Because uh, then you're not going because of repentance and faith. You're going because of self-righteousness. That's what I mean by that. All right, paragraph... Uh, oh, did I finish this paragraph? Uh, 22. Nevertheless, we strongly urge you by all means to make confession of your need, not with the intention of doing a worthy work by confessing, but in order to hear what God has arranged for you to be told. What I am saying is that you are to concentrate on the word, on the absolution, to regard it as a great and precious and magnificently splendid treasure, and to accept it with all praise and thanksgiving to God. If this were explained in detail, and if the need that ought to move and lead us to make confession were pointed out, then one would need little urging or coercion. For everyone's own conscience would so drive and disturb him that he would be glad to do what a poor and miserable beggar does when he hears that a rich gift of money or clothing is being handed out at a certain place. We are that beggar. So if we, if we were in need of, of clothes, and we knew someone was offering them for free, we would go get it, right? We're poor, miserable sinners. We confess that every single Sunday in the liturgy, right? So if there was this great gift that makes us not poor, miserable sinners, that actually makes us clean and holy for Jesus' sake, the forgiveness of sins, we should run and go get it. So as not to miss it, he would run there as fast as he can and would need no bailiff to beat and drive him on. Now suppose that in place of the invitation, one were to substitute a command to the effect that all beggars should run to that place but would not say why, nor mention what they should look for and receive there. What else would the beggar do but make the trip with distaste, without thinking of going to get a gift, but simply of letting people see what a poor, miserable beggar he is? This would bring him little joy and comfort, but only greater resentment against the command that was issued. This point here is, this is why our emphasis on, is on the absolution part. It's on the forgiveness of sins part. It's on the Jesus part. It's a wonderful treasure. View of it that way. Uh, paragraph 25. In just this way, the Pope's preachers kept silent in the past about the splendid gift and inexpressible treasure to be had through confession. And I would add here, too, so also the Missouri Synod preachers. We fail to teach what a splendid gift and inexpressible treasure this is. So don't think we're just picking on the Pope here. This is convicting all pastors who fail to teach the gift that absolution truly is. All they did was to drive people in crowds to confession with no further aim than to let them see what impure, dirty people they were. Who could go willingly to confession under such circumstances? We, however, don't say that people should look at you to see how filthy you are, using you as a mirror to preen themselves. Rather, we give this counsel. If you are poor and miserable, then go to confession and make use of its healing medicine. He who feels his misery and need will no doubt develop such a longing for it that he will run toward it with joy. But those who pay no attention to it and do not come of their own accord, we let them go their way. Let them be sure of this, however, that we do not regard them as Christians. Man, those are strong words. That doesn't convict you, and it convicts everyone. Even the people that go to confession. That convicts us even more. Man, I, last time I went, I didn't, I didn't appreciate the absolution for what it was, the treasure that it truly was. Though I say I'm a poor, miserable sinner, I didn't think I was that bad. You know, see what I'm saying? Damn, that, that just convicts. Paragraph 28. So we teach what, I'm almost done here, by the way. 
So we teach what a splendid, precious, and comforting thing confession is. Furthermore, we strongly urge people not to despise a blessing that in view of our great need is so priceless. Now, if you are a Christian, then you do not need either my pressuring or the Pope's orders, but you will undoubtedly compel yourself to come to confession and will beg me for a share in it. However, if you want to despise it and proudly continue without confession, then we must draw the conclusion that you are no Christian and should not enjoy the sacrament either. For you despise what no Christian should despise. And that way you make it so that you cannot have forgiveness of your sins. This is a sure sign that you also despise the gospel. Now, by the way, it should be said here too, uh, that this also does take place in the divine service. You do confess your sins when we say, I, a poor, miserable sinner. Don't think that that's not sufficient. Remember again, private confession is for the person that's really, really troubled with their sins. Make sure though you just take seriously what you are actually confessing in the divine service. Because we have it there. Uh, and it's, it, it maintains its, its part to properly uh, prepare us for what we are to receive in the Lord's Supper. To sum it up, we want to have nothing to do with coercion. However, if someone does not listen to or follow our preaching and its warning, we will have nothing to do with him, nor may he have any share in the gospel. If you were a Christian, then you ought to be happy to run more than 100 miles to confession and not let yourself be urged to come. I have a note here that I say, and yet I struggle to drive a few stinking miles. I don't have the word stinking. And yet I struggle to drive a few miles is all I have written here. Because we should, be, we should run 100 miles to get it, and yet we struggle to drive a few in a car. You should rather come and compel us to give you the opportunity in other words, so this is speaking of uh, the people should be coming to their pastor saying, please give me more opportunity to receive absolution. That's the point here. For in this matter, the compulsion must be the other way around. We, pastors, must act under orders. You must come in freedom. We pressure no one, but we let ourselves be pressured, just as we let people compel us to preach and to administer the sacrament. In other words, there's nothing better this should be. There, there should be nothing better than when a pastor is burdened by people saying, Pastor, we want you to preach more. We want you to administer more the sacrament more. Uh, we want you to receive absolution more. I mean, that should be the complaint of the people, so to speak, from, from faith. This is the point Luther is trying to make. The complaint of the people should be, we want more opportunities for this. Not the pastor saying, you need to come more for this. Does that make sense? See how, see how, the, how, how the gospel works there? It's, it's, it's always a flip, isn't it? All right, when I urge you to go to confession, I am doing nothing else than urging you to be a Christian. Actually, that's the quote that was in our small catechism. If I have brought you to the point of being a Christian, I have thereby also brought you to confession. For those who really desire to be true Christians, to be rid of their sins, and to have a cheerful conscience already possess the true hunger and thirst, they reach for the bread, just as Psalm 42 verse 1 says of a hunted deer, burning in the heat with thirst. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. In other words, as a deer with anxious and trembling eagerness strains toward a fresh flowing stream, so I yearn anxiously and tremblingly for God's word, absolution, the sacrament, and so forth. See, that would be teaching right about confession. And people could be given such a desire and love for it that they would come and run after us for it, more than we would like. Let the papists plague and torment themselves and others who pass up the treasure and exclude themselves from it. Let us, however, lift our hands in praise and thanksgiving to God. 1 Timothy 2.8 for having graciously brought us to this, our understanding of confession. All right, so there you go. There's our confession uh, Bible study. Uh, let's, uh, let's close together. Um, instead, of, uh, instead of doing what our normal machine, let's close with the Lord's Prayer, uh, reminding us since the Lord's Prayer kind of talked about uh, confession throughout and thinking about uh, the role of confession in our lives. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Next class will be class 23 on the doctrine of the office of the keys. We're going to talk about repentant sinners. We're also going to talk about excommunication. We'll see you next week.